I'm Jane Rudolph. I'm Father Joe Glass. Welcome to Real to Real. It's always nice to be back with you another week on Real to Real, but we do feel a little bit lonely when the gentleman on this side is missing. <laughs> when we're down to two chairs, it's not as nice as when we have all three. Monsignor Minot is healthy, wealthy, wise. He's traveling, and we look forward to his coming back to us real soon. He's all over the place, and tonight Real to Real is really all over the place <laughs> as well. We're going to take you really all across the country and also come right back home to meet once again Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons. Tonight he'll be talking about addictions and how anger plays a really big role in addictions. Also, for all grandmoms and aunts like me who love to cuddle their little ones, how would you like to do it as a full-time job? We'll meet a professional granny this evening. And we're also going to meet an old friend of Jane's when she used to work up in the Providence Diocese. We're going to meet Father Edward Flannery, who's going to be here to share his insight, and they're an expert really around the country. He's quite an expert on Christian-Jewish relationships in the church. We'll meet him later. And when you talk about Rhode Island, you have to talk about immigrants because it's a big state for people coming in from all different countries. Many of the immigrants all across the country face the problem of coming in without anything but their faith. Mm -hmm. And in our first story tonight, we're going to meet the, the Pham family, which is kind of a, an odd name, but they come with not only their faith, they come with a deep-seated gratitude. Like all refugees, each of the Vietnamese who had arrived in the United States had a special story. These immigrants brought emotional baggage, culture shock, the obligations of the extended Vietnamese family, and the legacy of the war itself. With their fears and anxieties, they also brought their hopes, their dreams, and the Roman Catholic faith. At first, I very fear. Uh, because uh, I bring my wife and my four children uh, with, uh, without any money at all. So I don't have any clothing, spare clothing, just only one suit I wear in my body. Same with my children. We don't have a time to pick up anything at all. And so we are very fear about that. I don't know what's going on in the future. After several years as a Chinook helicopter pilot for the South Vietnamese government during the war, Mr. Pham found himself in a strange land. In my head, I just escaped from, uh, evacuated from the communists, and I pray Virgin Mary and God, bring me to anywhere you want and set up my life. I feel very happy because we now we get uh, live, a habit to live in the United States, the most, the most country in the world. So safe and freedom. Uh, I have an uh, idea to build a shrine a long time when I am uh, 18 years old because uh, I think God and uh, Virgin Mary blessing all of my life. St. Pius X Church in Santa Fe Springs, California sponsored Mr. Pham and 35 other refugee families, securing apartments and even jobs for some of them. In gratitude for his family's safe exit from Vietnam and the church's assistance in building a new life, Mr. Pham decided that the Vietnamese community should pay for and build a shrine to the Blessed Virgin Mary at St. Pius. When Mr. Pham suggested uh, this uh, shrine, I thought he had uh, a small shrine in mind. But when he showed me the blueprints, I thought to myself, no way can uh, these uh, people do this. I, in my own pastorly way, thought I'd have to help finance uh, the project myself. But Mr. Pham knew in his heart that the Vietnamese community would respond to the challenge of his dream. He first approached influential elders like Mr. Thuy. Như vậy là cộng đoàn mình cố gắng, mình cố gắng, tôi xin cố gắng giúp anh. Soon after, a letter from the heart was mailed. Each family was asked to pray for the success of their collective dream and to sacrifice where they could to raise money for the materials. Everybody in our community, I understand they are very poor and that's enough money to 
so far in this country, 50% of them is uh, uh, unemployment. At first, I thought I had to finance to uh, build this shrine. It took two years of prayer and small sacrifices to raise the $14,000 to purchase the needed materials. The first thing when uh, Father John uh, came to uh, lay the first door, we are very happy. We think this uh, start to begin, begin a project. Laying on the foundation stone was the beginning of it. They had it all planned in detail. And I uh, just fit it in to their plan of uh, procession, the firecracker. They really scared the wits out of them uh, because we were not expecting them. But it is, again, a, an expression of uh, joy in the Vietnamese culture. With great joy and pride in their hearts, the Vietnamese community started to build their shrine. Each individual contributed their skills. For Mr. Pham's father, it took two weeks to embroider the Virgin Mary's cape. Stitch by stitch, the dream was coming true. Finally, on October 15, 1988, the entire congregation of all ethnic groups celebrated Mr. Pham's shrine. Held outdoors, a platform had been built in the form of a boat to represent the escape of many from Vietnam. I select the statue with the rosary with one hand up. That means uh, she uh, blessing us, peace with us, and pray by rosary, and ev everything should be safe and peace. The Virgin Mary Shrine represents hope and love and the everlasting gratitude of this Vietnamese community. It's interesting to see how Father was helping out the Vietnamese. Obviously, his heritage from Ireland and the Irish were faced with the same immigration problems just about 100 years ago that continue to today. Stay with us. Coming up next, Father Joe Glass has Elena Santoro. Since 1981, Real to Real has been proclaiming the good news by bringing you stories of Christian faith in action. We do it by roaming the Delaware Valley, searching for people of faith, hope, and charity. But like all modern media, it is an expensive proposition. If you're a new viewer or if you've enjoyed Real to Real for many years, we'd like to thank you for watching and invite you to participate by actively supporting the show. With costs rising all around us, we need your financial support. A donation of five, ten, twenty dollars, or whatever you can send will help to keep us on the air. Send your contributions to Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, room 907, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. And thank you. Hello, I'm Gary Maddox. Learning to read can change your life. To get help, call the Mayor's Commission on Literacy at 686-8652. Happy to introduce now Elena Santora, who is the director of the Department of Migration and Refugee Resettlement for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Elena, welcome to Real to Real. Thank you, Father. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to have you here tonight, too. We just saw a nice piece on a family coming over and their gratitude for being in, in America and, and, and the protection that they felt the Blessed Mother provided them on their whole journey and resettlement. And you see this all the time. You deal with immigrants and refugees. In fact, you kind of get two titles, I guess, the <laughs> migration and, and refugee resettlement. Can you give us a little description of each side of your office? Yes, in our department, the migration program um, takes care of any immigration problems that people may have. Uh, we help people to process their cases with the Immigration Service, uh, whether it be family reunification, political asylum, labor certifications. There's quite a few benefits that people are entitled to. We work with both the immigrant 
the refugee and the American population then may want to bring relatives here or um, have any other type of immigration problem. And of course, I imagine we could say that any dealings with your office are in complete confidence. So if anyone has questions or about their own status or a friend or they know someone who, who could use this kind of assistance, that they can, they can be very trusting when they call Absolutely. your office. Absolutely. Everything that okay. said in our office is of complete confidence. Now let's move to the other side, refugee resettlement. What, what uh, do you see? Who's coming into this country and, and how are the numbers? Uh, okay, our office was established in 1975 to coincide with the falling of Saigon. At that time the bishops requested the diocese throughout the United States to assist in the resettlement of the Southeast Asian refugees. Since that time it has grown to encompass people from many, many countries of this world. We have worked with uh, Polish, Ethiopian, Afghan, Hungarians, Romanians, Czechoslovakians. Uh, Which is interesting because I think when we, when we think of refugees or who's coming to this country, we think of you know, Southeast Asians, but the, so many other countries are involved too constantly. Yeah. Yes, they are. And it's also very interesting that the majority of people coming to the U.S. from other countries today are of the Catholic faith. So uh, it fits very well for us to be involved in that work and uh, assist people. What do you see as their main needs when a, when a refugee comes to this country, when they come to your office? What well, are the main problems facing? Them? They come basically, uh, most of them come with nothing. Uh, just a bag with documents. If they're lucky, they may have a couple of bags of clothing. That's about it. So we assist with every basic need. We have housing ready. We uh, purchase beds for them, furniture, household goods, linens, um, pots and pans, the works, and everything. besides all those basic necessities, I'm sure too they need help with just, uh, what, would you, what would be the correct word, enculturation? Acculturation. Uh, learning how things are done in America, or, like, how, to, how to get a number three bus or something like exactly. that. Exactly. It's a tremendous culture shock for most people coming. Of course, the Eastern Europeans have it a little bit easier because their culture is not all that different from ours. But people from Southeast Asia or Africa or the Middle East they need that help. Um, yeah. have a now, tremendous Tell me money. though, you're, you're overstaffed and you've got plenty of people to take care of all these needs, right? No, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> we are, uh, you know, every year the government cuts back funding and yet expects more from us. Um, we are fortunate to have support from our diocese to continue this work, but even with that it's not enough. We are very, very dependent on volunteers to help us. Refugees need to learn English, they need to find the number three bus, mm -hmm. they um, get around the city, um, how to access health care, registration for their children in school. I, mean, I, mm -hmm. I couldn't enumerate all the things they need. Without the help of volunteers, uh, we would not be able to do our job. Right. And you're always in need of those volunteers to be sometimes just a good friend or a, exactly. a big brother or a big sister to, exactly. to some of these refugees. Yes, yeah. we have a volunteer demonstration project right now going on okay. uh, with primarily aimed at the youth that are coming to help with tutoring uh, after school and for some recreation pro uh, programs to um, help the mainstream yeah. and, and be them able to feel at home. Right? Exactly. Elena, thank you for being here. Thanks so much. And remember, for, to help Elena with her uh, Office of Migration and Refugee Services, get in touch with us here at Real to Real. That number will be coming up later, and we'll put you in touch with Elena. And now back to you, Jane. Thank you, Father. Earlier tonight, we talked about immigration when we saw the Vietnamese people. And they dealt with poverty, with loneliness, and a language barrier, and yet they still reacted with faith and with love. Well, tonight, Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons is going to show us how to react when anger arises from our difficult situations. The relationship between anger and addictive behavior is a complicated one. I'm sure many of us know people who seem peaceful, mild, pleasant. Then they have a few drinks, and they become nasty and hostile. On the other hand, we probably know people who are irritable and tense after work, for example. They have a few drinks, and they seem to calm down. As a psychiatrist, I've been disturbed at many morning meetings in drug and alcohol rehab seeing grown men act like little boys when relating how angry and sad they were about how hurt they were in their family lives. Equally, I've seen women similarly upset because of being victimized by physical or sexual abuse when they were children or teenagers. 
Now recently, there was a study of over 300 alcoholics followed for two years to see if they could determine any, any factors were associated with going back onto alcohol. The two major factors they found in this study were first, depression or loneliness, and second, anger. So anger does play a major role in the use of alcohol. Okay, now what are some of the major causes of anger in those who are addicted? First, loneliness. People who are lonely regularly become irritable. Secondly, there are many addicted people who are very upset in their jobs. They have difficult bosses, difficult coworkers. They're not paid adequately. They're upset after work and they drink as a way to cool off. Other addicted people are very angry with themselves. They don't like their bodies. They don't like something about themselves. So they drink to try to escape from that. Some are angry because they're victims of poverty. And others because they experience the epidemic today of the collapse of the family. And they feel cheated out of a basic right to a mother and a father. Now, certain things can be done to overcome this anger. It's been my experience, though, that too few rehabs focus intensively enough on treating anger with the exception of a few like self-help in the Northeast. Unfortunately, many addicts only know that they can get rid of their anger by denying it or by expressing it. But expressing anger doesn't free a person from anger because most of us have buried so much anger that when we move to express it, we overreact. The only way to ultimately get rid of anger is by understanding those who've hurt us and by trying to forgive them. That is, using our minds or our hearts to let go of that anger, to pardon the person. Now, unfortunately, there are some people who don't give up their anger. They're almost addicted to their anger. They hold on to their anger because their anger gives them a sense of strength or power, or they like the feeling of rebelling and punishing people. Other people have a difficult time giving up their anger because they've been hurt so deeply in the past that they can't forgive. For these people, they can use step one of the great 12 steps and think that I'm powerless over my anger and I've got to turn it over to a higher power, God. When you do that, you begin to feel anger within you diminish. You feel more peaceful, more relaxed, and people are then less inclined to turn to alcohol or drugs to deal with their anger. I think that whole aspect of anger and studying about it is so important to our sense of well-being. Anger is a, is a natural and a healthy emotion, actually, and most people it's just when it gets to these levels where, where uh, it's extreme, then it has to be dealt with in something better than denial or, or expressing that anger, but uh, often anger is really the start of a healing process in a lot of wounded relationships. We hope everybody stays with the process tonight as we continue with more on Real to Real. Stop crying when you go like this. We just do, and it's amazing. Middle of the night when all else fell. Ah, uh, excuse me. I want to give blood. You're in the right place. Come with me. I heard about those people in the accident. I just want to help. Great. How are they doing anyway? Well, last we heard, they're going to be just fine. You know, it's a good thing you guys were there. No, it's a good thing you are here. Call the American Red Cross. Your neighbors need you. We welcome your comments and suggestions and encourage you to write to us at Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, room 907, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103, or call us during regular business hours at 215-668-9842. Tonight you're going to meet a dear old friend of mine, Father Edward Flannery, whose office was just right down the street when we were working together in Providence, Rhode Island. He is recognized as a leader in the whole country in some of the Jewish and Christian relationships. And tonight you're going to meet this eloquent man who writes and speaks on the importance of a healthy Jewish-Christian relationship. And as important as Jewish-Christian relationships are, I don't think there's any relationship more important than that between parents and their children. And helping to get parents and newborns off on a great start, we're going to meet Lenny Carter, a professional granny. Those who observe the social scene tell us that there is a rise of anti-Semitism in the, in the United States today and elsewhere in the world. It was ever thus. 
I've been a student now for many years of Christian-Jewish relations, and I'm well aware of the depth and length of this longest hatred in human history, of the involvement of the church in it in the past, and though it is milder today, how widespread it is among Christians. The Vatican Council condemned it as a sin, as did all theologians of the major churches. We are reminded that Jesus was a Jew, a loyal Jew throughout his earthly life, and his mother was a Jewish mother who brought him up as a Jew. It was Leon Bloy, the French writer, who wrote that Jesus takes anti-Semitism as a slap on the face of his mother. The apostles were all Jews, and the earliest church was entirely Jewish. Obviously, for a Christian to be an anti-Semite is a contradiction and a scandal. It's incumbent on all Christians to search their souls to seek any traces of this ailment and be purged of it. And better, they might also join in the struggle against it, opposing manifestations of it anywhere. And we should pray for the Jewish people and perhaps begin to show them that Christian love that they have been denied for almost 2,000 years. We can do no less for our Jewish God and Savior. It's not easy being a brand new parent. In fact, when that warm little bundle in your arms is suddenly seen as an awesome responsibility, it can be overwhelming. Happily, new parents in La Jolla, California can turn to Lanny Carter, a professional granny and a woman who has guided literally hundreds of new parents in infant care through her special gifts of patience and love. Congratulations to all of you. I don't have to tell you what an exciting time of your life this is. It really, to have a healthy baby is what this is all about. And you all had the healthy baby and we're just delighted that you did. Uh, besides being the most wonderful time of your life, it's also going to be the most exhausting time of your life in the next few days. So uh, once you get home from the hospital, if you're expecting that perfect child that's been here in the nursery all tight asleep and brought to you clean, doesn't happen, right? And in case you don't know who I am, I'm the grandmother of all your children. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do today is show you how to give Scotty a bath. And to Scotty, uh, I'm going to introduce him to all of you now. I hope you don't mind passing. Well, after I lost my husband um, after being married for 27 years. And I had never had a career. My children were grown. And I didn't know what to do with my life at that point. And um, I've always loved children and babies. And I had a friend that was a pediatrician who um, suggested I come down and just work in their office part time. And uh, that worked into a part time counseling position with the new parents that just needed that emotional support from a non professional, which I was. And at that point, I thought I would really love to do it for a local hospital. And now it's been seven, almost seven years. And in those seven years, I've grandparented almost 8,000 babies. It's OK. You want to see how he stops crying when you go like this? He just do. And it's amazing. In the middle of the night, when all else fails, this is the way you hold them. And it's perfectly safe for their heads to fall forward. Don't get nervous, Bill. It's fine. It's just coming back that you need to give it support. What do you do with a baby that has very fair skin? I would say Neutrogena, probably, but that's something that your pediatrician should probably tell you. As I say, most of our doctors here are re recommending. Um, there are many books. I think there's something like 5,000 books on how to take care of babies. Uh, I think the more they read, the more confused they get. And I think parenting is a very natural thing if they allow themselves to trust in their own parenting. Babies uh, probably will thrive a lot better when they have the relaxed parent. But I just tell them, if you love your baby and feed them and change them, you're just fine for the next six months, and then I'll tell you what to do six months from now. He's being a good boy. Can I keep him? He's being awfully good. You go with him. <laughs> you want to come home with me, too, with him? You're being the best boy. I'm very proud of you. Since I've been here seven years, I've seen families as many as four children. And I live in town. Of course, I see them in every supermarket, every grocery store. And parents are still calling. I get Christmas cards. I mean, this, this room is filled with Christmas cards from the way, way back ones. Um, so I, I have that contact. Tell, tell me how it went yesterday during the day. And letters come in constantly and phone calls and 
and just meeting them on the street. I, you know, people that I have forgotten who they are and meeting them, and they say, I couldn't have made it without you. But I think it's very comfortable, and even the mothers that I see or run into say, you know, Lenny, I never called you, but just knowing you were there just made it so much easier for me. You know, I just knew that there was somebody in case I needed them. Lanny's help, the, the, the fact that she is there and available to be spoken to at any time gives a parent more confidence because you feel, you feel that you have someone that can tell you what to do if there is any kind of an emergency. And it's somebody that is familiar with you and your family and um, it, it's just a comforting thing. And because of that, it makes you more calm with your baby. And when you're more calm with your baby, you're a better parent. Hey, do you know how to, to burp them? I was just going to ask you if you could give me a little advice okay, on Okay, why burping. don't you sit him up on your lap? You know how to sit him up? Not really. This okay. type, type of a job, first of all, I think it can pre prevent child abuse. I think that the parent that get to the point where they just don't know what else to do and they can pick up the phone instead of picking up their child, I really think that. I think working with the fathers as closely as I do and giving them both a good idea of what they can expect with the newborn. Coming home with a newborn is very, can be very difficult for a marriage. Maybe even we're, we're preventing some divorces because of it. And so when you feel that you're doing this kind of thing, you're preventing child abuse to some degree and maybe keeping families together, I mean, you feel like, you know, of course, it has to be spiritual as well as, as emotionally satisfying. What calls me is that I think that there's a need. And I think if I can fill it as successfully as obviously as it's turned out to be, um, it's wonderful. It's wonderful for me and for the parents. Oh, you did such a good job. We were talking about all the hospitals that are in the area. Wouldn't that be a wonderful job for someone who loves children to go in and see if they need a volunteer grandma? Yeah, I think uh, Lainey really hit on something there. In fact, I could use her services. I don't know if they just allow the parents in, but I'm one of these priests, you know, at the baptism, when they say, oh, won't you hold the baby, Father? I get so nervous. <laughs> Those children are so little, they're so tiny. I don't, I don't really hold the children until about their first communion. No, I think. Yeah. then you just pat them on the head, <laughs> I right? give them a little nod on the head. I do. I get so nervous. I'd like to sit in on one of her classes. <laughs> well, join us next week when we find out what else Father Joe Glass doesn't like about babies. <laughs> no, really. We're going to have another week of stories of faith, hope, and love, so join us then. And you can be sure I'll have someone else in the hot seat over there. Until then, good night. God bless. See you next week. God bless you. Travel arrangements for Real to Real by Atkinson and Mullen Travel of Media PA. Phone area 215-359-5980. For years now, we've had a great men's prayer breakfast. For years now, we've had an even better women's prayer luncheon. Both events are held at Williamson's Restaurant atop the GSB building at City Line and Belmont Avenue. Our women's prayer luncheon is this Wednesday, March 15th at 12 noon. And our breakfast is this Saturday, March 18th at 9 a.m. To register for either event, call 215-668-HOPE. See you Wednesday. See you Saturday.